Titus 3, verses 4 and 5. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You guys like water? I myself, I'm learning to really enjoy water. I, I think it tastes good. I think I feel better when I drink an awful lot of it. And I hoard it. My body hoards it. When you think about it, the body is about 60% water. So if I say, you and a camel have something in common, please don't be offended. And from what the scientists tell us, you may be hoarding a great amount of water in your head. Because after all, the brain is about 75% water. Have you ever noticed? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when you don't drink enough water, how bad you feel? Yes. How tired and run down and you just can't, you just ache all over. There's, you see, water is essential for functioning of the body. If you were to look it up online, you would find that water helps regulate our temperatures. It carries nutrients and oxygen to the cells. It cushions our joints. It protects our organs and tissues, and it removes waste. You can live over a month without food, but you can't live more than a week without water. In fact, every cell in your body, all 37.2 trillion, according to recent checks, and, you know, I'm sorry, I might have 40 million <laughs> in my body. Are they, just <laughs> they all require water to operate. And get this, now get this, now this is a thing that just might just maybe blow you away a little bit. But because of how God created the system with water, with all the precipitation, condensation, and all of the other stuff that goes along with it, you could very well be drinking the same water Jesus drank when he was walking on earth. Yep. Ooh, that's enough to blow your mind away right there by itself. Mm -hmm. Simply put, water is essential for all life, whether it be human, animal, vegetable. Without water, it just does not work. It is essential for all growth and for all fruitfulness. So why talk about water? Why should we do that? Well, it's because water, especially flowing water like rivers and such, are a natural picture of the Holy Spirit. As essential as water is for the human body to survive and operate, it's just as essential for your spiritual being of a, to have that Holy Spirit within you operating. So let's begin with what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit and the river of living water. Let's go to John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus stood and cried out on that last day of the feast. So what feast was it? And why do they speak of rivers of flowing water on this day? Well, is there a connection between that day and what he said? Well, of course you know there is, otherwise we wouldn't be standing here talking about it. So let's just look at this. The Jews had this ceremony where they would carry pitchers of water from the pool of Siloam, and they would pour out over the silver basin next to the brazen altar of the burnt offering for each of the first seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. And as they were doing this on the eighth day, 
Well, they didn't pour out any water. They didn't have to pour out any water on the eighth day, which made Christ's offer of water, of eternal life, even more startling. And I bet it really shocked the daylights out of those priests when they were doing it. Because, well, what's he saying? We don't have any water that we can pour out. The Jewish people had gone through the, this religious observance and yet their hearts were not satisfied. They just weren't satisfied because they truly did not understand the deep meaning of the feast. Now, just before they departed for their homes on that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out to them. He invited them to come to him for spiritual satisfaction. The Believer's Bible commentary stated that as the priest poured out the water, the crowds would yell out, and this comes out of Psalm 118.25, Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. The rabbis at the time knew and taught that the pouring out of water during uh, the feast was symbolic of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which would come upon Israel in the last days. And this is true for the Feast of Tabernacle points to the coming day of the Messianic Kingdom when Jesus dwells, or tabernacles, with his people from Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. Wow! It was into this dramatic scene that Jesus rose and spoke to them crowds. Come to me, come to me, and drink. <clears throat> Jesus knew that the living water would soon be available for all who wanted to drink it. So let's think about, uh, let's look briefly at the things that Jesus said real quick. If anyone is thirsty, Jesus contrasted our natural need for water with our spiritual thirst. Everyone gets thirsty naturally, and there should be a spiritual thirst within us as well for the reality, truth, and the purpose that is found only in Jesus. Now, there's this French dude. He was a mathematician, a physicist, and a religious philosopher, and his name was Blaise Pascal, and he was born and, and lived back in the mid-1600s. And he said something that was really famous, only you wouldn't recognize it necessarily as he said it. You may recognize it as when we talk about people that have this hole. <clears throat> that they try and fill up with everything. And they, it never gets filled unless Christ comes into their hearts. And what he said is, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. Man, he was a smart dude back in the 1600s, and really smart for a Frenchman. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't resist, because I remember the C.S. Lewis book that the French are only for the French. And this man thought of this. And we all know that the people that are never satisfied have that hole in their heart or in their soul that can only be satisfied with Christ. The invitation here is given to anyone, but they've got to see their need. There must first be a thirst or a desire for spirituality, reality that needs to be quenched. Jesus added on to that, let him come to me and drink. Spiritual thirst can only be, it can only be truly quenched in Jesus. We know that. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm a leaky person. I don't have this continuous desire to fulfill and fill a hole in my life because I don't really think I have one. I've got Jesus. With that, with him in my life, I really don't need anything else. Everything else is gravy. All must come to Jesus himself, not rules, not religion, and not some church programs. Jesus said, come to me and drink. Now this applies to the believer as well as the unbeliever. 
Even though your hole has been filled, you still need to come to Jesus on a daily basis. You need to be satisfied through Him. Sometimes as believers, we get back into the routine of churchianity with its services and programs and forget that it is the coming to Jesus that is the most important. Now, I actually had to look up uh, Christi, uh, 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 churchianity a little bit because I was like, well, that's kind of a strange word to me, and I kind of, you know, I got a, had a rough idea what it meant, but I looked it up anyways, and it means any practices of Christianity that are viewed as placing a larger emphasis on the habits of church life or the institutional traditions of the church rather than on theology and spiritual teachings of Jesus. The quality of being too church focused. When? Doesn't that sound like the religious leaders in Jesus' day? Doesn't that sound like some people that we know? I know lots of people that are into churchianity and not really what counts. In the day of Jeremiah, God rebuked his people saying in Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they had replaced the reality with the ritual and their relationship with God with religion. They were trying to get their water from both broken cisterns when God himself offered he offered springs of living water. And then we add on to that, Jesus said from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. For those that believed and accepted Jesus, there would be a living source of water that would come from within. This obviously pictures the Holy Spirit that would dwell within us. Within that believer, giving that person an inner source of strength and peace that, was, un, that is, was unseen to those looking on. Isn't that why you get people looking at you and they might come up and say, why are you so different? You've got that peace. You've got that joy. You've got that over sense of fulfillment with the Holy Spirit just overflowing out of you. Every pore. It reminds me of Shrek when Fiona was coming up. And, and, he, and it got kissed by Shrek for the first true love. And she floated in the air and light came out of her pores. That's the Holy Spirit. It's just like that. You see everything. You see it all. And because God's nature is always to give, the overflowing of this inner spiritual water would proceed outward to help others. Don't you just have that natural desire? to help people that are looking for help. Mm -hmm. Now what Jesus said is a, as a reality was pictured and prophesied about in various passages in the Bible. So let's kind of look at a few of these of the more prominent cases where a river pictured the flow of living waters that Jesus mentioned. Do you know that the first mention of a river, what it was in the Bible? Well, we got to go right back to the beginning back into Genesis. And we get to look at this lovely thing in Genesis 2, verses 8 through 14. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out from Eden to water the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good and Bedellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second is the Gihon and it flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The first mention of the river is associated with the Garden of Eden. The garden that God planted in all its perfection. Keep that in mind now. Keep that one in mind. An interesting point is that the river actually flowed out from Eden. Flowed out from it. The word Eden means pleasure or delight. 
and its source of beauty and fruitfulness was this river from deep within. Oh, I hope that you can actually see how this is a picture of the Holy Spirit who was to be living waters within the believer just as Jesus said. Just as this flowing river provided all that Eden required for beauty and fruitfulness, so does the flowing of the Spirit from deep within the believer's body. There was a hidden spring of water within Eden, just as there is within the believer in this age. You've got the river of living water in you. And it flows. If you don't dam it up. It flows. Now the river split in those four, the Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates, and a couple of those names are noteworthy. Gihon means the valley of grace, and the Euphrates means fruitfulness. Now Adam and Eve lived in this perfect environment with the grace, provision, and presence of God. <coughs> there was fruitfulness and complete peace. Eden and man was a pleasure and delight. The garden contained the tree of life, which if Adam and Eve had uh, partaken of it, they would have lived forever. We know that because other all, that's why this tree of life. This pictured the Lord Jesus himself, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And all who partake of him will gain eternal life. And as we have seen, the fruitfulness and beauty of this garden was due to a river that watered this garden, keeping it well hydrated. Hmm. All was well until they decided to eat the fruit of the other tree, thanks to Satan and his prompting. The effects of that decision affect us all still today. So now, for just a note, that this first river that flowed out of Eden, which had its source within Eden and watered the Garden of Eden, this pictured the life-giving water of the Holy Spirit within the believer today, who is our only source of life, beauty, and fruitfulness. True? Yeah. Another famous and important passage concerning the, the rivers of flowing water comes out of Exodus. No doubt you remember the story in Exodus 17, 1 through 6, where Moses struck that rock the first time. Everybody was moaning and groaning, we're thirsty, give us water. They were doing more than just moaning and groaning, they were deeply complaining, and we know that. But water at that point in time was a necessity. They were dying of thirst. They didn't trust the Lord. So the Lord instructs Moses to do something odd. Strike the rock, the Lord said, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Now, in case you have in your mind a picture of a little water dribbling out of that rock, well, we all know different. We know that when Moses struck that rock, a river, a gushing river, flowed to, so that six million plus people and animals could drink. They were satisfied. And we know that over 600,000 people came out, or men came out of Egypt, because that's what it told in this Exodus 21, 37. <clears throat> but I want you to consider what the Psalms say about that rock. Psalm 78, 15, and 16. He split the rock in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Also in Psalm 105, 41, he opened the rock and water gushed out. It ran in the dry places like a river. It was a huge gushing thing. And, it's, uh, and believe it or not, we have found this rock. We found the rock and it's huge. It's this huge thing. Rivers of water flowed from it and even smoothing a lot of the ground and stuff around it. And when, when God gets someone to do something odd, you can be sure there's always a reason. And this incident is an amazing picture of and type of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and you and me. Remember, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The rock, uh, this picture is the true rock, the Lord Jesus who was struck, who was struck for you and I. 
And Moses, well, he's a picture of you and I, of course, for we all struck that rock. We all played a part in nailing him into a tree, for he died for all our sins. He was struck by us and for us. And the water, this picture is the Holy Spirit, the living water that poured forth into the hearts of believers after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Just as this water reinvigorated and quenched the thirst of the Israelites, so the Holy Spirit does the same for believers from within. We're satisfied. Now the river of God picturing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is also to be seen in a unique way in the coming age. Firstly, we read what, hap what will happen in the days of the king. When the Messiah Jesus rules over the planet earth from Jerusalem. Let's look at the prophecy given in Zechariah 14, 8 and 9. And in that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. Zechariah spoke of a coming day when living water would flow from Jerusalem. The amazing thing is that day is really pretty close. It's really pretty close. And we can never forget that the last chapter of the Bible starts with the ultimate fulfillment of what was seen at the start of Genesis. The tree of life and the river of life are seen and available once again. Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. When I met with Dave, I was talking about this, and I said, Dave, I says, I'm not saying, because I don't really have the proof behind this, but it says that water flowed from within Eden, and we're told that the water will flow from under the throne in the New Jerusalem. Was the Garden of Eden around Jerusalem? I don't know. But that's something that makes me go, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I love how it speaks of the river of water of life being clear as crystal, flowing straight from the throne of God. What image does water as clear as crystal give? It speaks of utter purity without any contaminants. Pure water, pure and holy, just crystal clear goodness. Man, isn't that the picture of the Holy Spirit? Pure, crystal clear, and good. Nothing mixed in with it. Now, I don't think we can even really find a body of water here on earth that's pure. Not a one. Now, there's a few places in New Zealand that claim they've got the most pure, crystal clear water in the world. I don't know. I ain't never been to New Zealand. But I do know that right over there in Montana, we got this body of water called Flathead Lake, which appears crystal clear and that if you look at the pictures of it, it looks like it's only about this deep. Oh man, it's like 370 feet deep. I mean, you can see all the way to the bottom and it only looks like it's this deep. <laughs> in contrast, and it's, it's not pure. It has contaminants in it. In contrast, the river of life in the age to come will be that real McCoy. It's 100% pure Jerusalem. It's 100% pure, pure heaven. It's 100% pure new earth. And it's 100% pure Holy Spirit goodness in every way that is coming for believers. For the weary soul tired of living in a corrupted world, in a corrupted body, with desires for good, yet mixed with results. This is certain hope in uncertain times. You know, even in my water bottle that, I, that we just got recently, that filters out pretty much all the impurities, will taste nothing like that water. 
So we have seen both from Genesis and Revelation that the river of life is related to fruitfulness, beauty, and life. Eden was a pleasure and a delight because it was watered by an underground spring that flowed to a river. Revelation gives us a glimpse of the age to come where the river of life will feed the tree of life and it will produce fruit, both literal and spiritual, every month of the year. The waters are directly related to fruit. But what about today? What about today? Didn't we start with Jesus saying that the believers would receive the Holy Spirit and that from their innermost being will flow rivers of living water? Well, yeah, we did say that. Christians, we all want to be fruitful, but how? How? The Holy Spirit was given so that we may have life and fruitfulness once again. There is one last passage in the Old Testament that I'd like to look at for it shows the difference between being barren and being fruitful, even in difficult conditions. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and, whom, and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and it will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. This passage contrasts two men. Contrast two. The first trusts in himself and fellow men for the answers and tries to reach his goal from his own human strength and resources. Think about the world today. Think about the world and contrast these two people. This leads to a curse with the result looking something like a dry bush in the desert. This one has much to fear. The second doesn't trust in himself or his own resources. He trusts in the Lord and places his hope in God. This leads to a blessing with the result looking like a tree planted by the waters. This one will not fear even when the dry times of drought come. There's no need to. The roots are deep and being fed through water. And you can tell because they're not dried up and ancient. They're full of green and reaching out. He will continue to yield fruit through this hidden unseen source of supply. For the one who trusts in the Lord, there is a hidden source of life-giving water inwardly available. Through the presence of what? The Holy Spirit. Even when times of drought come outwardly, in the language of the New Testament, this is abiding in the vine. We all understand that one. It is being fed through the life of the vine. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. But our hearts like to deceive us and think that we can do it. When you start your Christian life, you realize that you are but a babe in Christ and you need him 100% of the time. You need him that all that. Then as you learn and grow, you start to think you can handle things. Mm. Your heart starts to tell you that you can do lots of things now on your own. You've got this Christian life figured out and can produce the goods. Maybe you start to think that you really only need about 20% of the Lord. And you only need that in the tough times. <laughs> when I was young, and I know that may seem like a long time ago, it does to me. And I was living at home in the late 70s. I had a very special relationship with my mom. We would sit up on Friday nights when my dad worked for Chrysler and he worked the swing shift and he would usually get home about one o'clock in the morning. And we would sit and we would talk and we would drink tea. And she taught me how to embroider so I can fix holes in my clothes so I can sew on buttons. 
And we watched the Midnight Special. Mom was really into rock and roll back then. Mom was also a great big Corey Ten Boom fan. Everybody likes, likes Corey. She's produced some of the really cool sayings and, and stuff in the world. And she had said something about having dependence on God. So I looked it up because, you know, Corey Ten Boom, she, an amazing woman, said all kinds of stuff. And I looked it up, and it, it says, she asked, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? <laughs> In other words, is it something that you daily rely on for direction or just keep the lock away for emergencies? You know, that 20% that you might need God. <laughs> While we wouldn't verbalize it like this, maybe you start to wonder if your maturity at, uh, is it such a level that you are totally fine now by yourself? I love it every time I think that I am. And I get slapped down pretty hard. And I go, well, God, why'd you do that? I'm a Christian. I believe in you. I trust in you. I just don't want to burden you. And that slapping me down makes me come right back to fully trust on him. And it's just amazing because I found that lately it's less and less time that I spend being slapped down as I get older. Is that a sign of Christian maturity? Yeah. Is that a good heart that will produce fruit? Or does that sound more like the first man in the passage above that ended up looking like that old dried up nasty bush in the dry ground? Let's look at that next verse in, in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. The heart deceives it because it tells us we can be something without God. That is obviously the lie right from the beginning. It tells us that when Jesus said we can do nothing without him, well, that just can't be right. And so the Lord tests the heart and mind. Why test a deceitful heart, you say? Why would that happen? What is he hoping to find in such a heart besides deceitfulness? Well, there is something that he looks for, and it is still critical. He looks for a heart that realizes that without him, I am nothing. And that knows, and one that knows that fruit only comes through being linked to him. Romans 7 4 tells us, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. We are called to a person, not a religion, not legalism. We are called and committed to him. Jesus and to all that he has for us specifically in order that we might bear fruit to God it is the only way to bear fruit and what will that fruit look like well like the gifts of the spirit there is both common and specific fruit the fruit that is common to all is the fruit of the Holy Spirit manifesting through your life and in your life and again what it tells us in Galatians 5 22 and 23 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. But there will also be a specific fruit that God has planned for your life. And this will generally involve giving to others for God's heart is always for people. Always. Just as the living water is flowing water, so the Spirit inputs into us in our life so that it can flow towards us, through us, towards others. So stay in fellowship with the Lord. <clears throat> Enjoy the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and thank God for the gifts of His Spirit. Realize that no tree can produce anything from trying harder. An apple tree doesn't have to strain to produce an apple. It happens naturally. As long as its roots have good access to food and water. 
And as we have seen above, that tree that is planted by the waters will produce even when the heat comes. No matter how nasty and horrible the world looks, as long as we're producing, it'll be seen. It produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It produces fruit that will abide for all eternity. And how? Well, we saw that our trust has to be in the Lord. Our roots have got to go down deep into that water. In and of ourselves, we don't have what it takes to produce lasting spiritual fruit. But never forget, never forget that God is a master of it. And as we abide in Him, we shall bear lasting fruit. Let's go to prayer.